already on live, uh, and uh, that's exciting to me. And we'll we'll get the official show started. For those of you joining us on Facebook Live, just just hang out, just be uh, patient. I gotta I gotta shake out the nervous energy. First time I'm having Mr. Eric Jacobs on the uh, on the microphone. Thank you. All right, are you ready, sir? Sure. All right, here we go with the official start of the next segment of No Vacancy Podcast in three, two, one. Welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast. It's me, uh, Glenn Hausman, again. I'm with uh, Eric Jacobs, Marriott International's Chief Development Officer of Select Brands North America. And yes, I read that so I wouldn't screw it up. Hey, how are you, well, sir? Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, really great to have you here. So um, we're here, we're recording this, and it's on Facebook Live during the uh, HoaCon 2018 here at the Gaylord National in Washington, D.C. Coincidentally, a uh, Marriott property. So uh, do, you feel, do you feel extra at home? when uh, AHO was meeting at a Marriott? We always feel more at home when we're here. And, of course, we always like to, to grab as many of the national conventions that we can uh, as it relates to the industry. Yeah. So it's awesome to have the uh, AHO members here with us today. Well, thank God I have my uh, Marriott loyalty number because I feel like all I'm doing right now is taking tours of uh, Gaylord Hotels. I've, I've been in a... Opryland, I think, twice in the last year. I'm here now at the National. I've got, um, I'm happy to say, and here's my shameless plug, I'm speaking at uh, DirecTV's annual uh, conference coming up in a few weeks at the Texan. And uh, I just found out I'm going to be going to uh, even more of them. What's Denver opening? Do you happen to know that offhand? We're, we're, we're pushing for year end, but I think, you know, I don't want to quote 100%, but I think it might be first quarter. But they're, they're hustling. I was out there about a month ago, and man, they're moving fast. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to be fair, I didn't expect to talk about this, but of course, I just told you before <laughs> we started recording that I like to talk about things that I don't expect to talk about. That project, I never thought it was going to happen because I remember the big kerfuffle that they had with all the, uh, the unions and stuff in, in town. It's got to be about 10 years. Years ago, when the, the Palms and Texan were all being built and stuff like that. That's correct. But it's so much more fun now to see it's actually here. It's coming. Um, any idea how it's going to be differing compared to the uh, the Palms of Texan or this one here? I mean, I think one of the things that Gaylord uh, does well, and the developers, uh, Ira Mitzner and their group, uh, Rita Development, they, they really want to look at how do we make it local. So I did a hard hat tour mm -hmm. uh, late last year, and the kind of the touches that you know and feel like you're in. In, in the Colorado region and, and in the Rocky Mountain region, I think will be key. Just like if you go to the Texan in, right. in Dallas, it's got a great feel. Uh, so the, the atrium is just going to be a giant weed grow farm. Is that what I can, <laughs> I can expect? <laughs> All right, just mess around. But that's, Den that's Denver for you. So you've been coming to HOA since 1996. I think my first one was in 97, 98. must be amazing to see how much this community has changed in the 20 years plus that you've been coming to this event. It has. It's, it's always, a spe you know, what's fun about coming for me yeah. um, is that uh, 22 years ago, I was, uh, you know, doing, doing business with the grandfather. You know, and mm -hmm. then five or ten years later, I'm doing business with the uh, with the with the father. Now we're talking about the sons and the daughters, and and the second, and maybe in, in, in some cases, the third or fourth generation. Right. Uh, we do a lot of work. Marriott does in partnering with AHOA, whether it's the young professional groups or the women's uh, AHOA um, outreach group, and and we're just spending a lot of time together about how do we continue to grow the relationship. So for me, it's always a, a great homecoming. It's a great opportunity to see the families that I've been doing business right. with for twenty something years. Um, it's a great week for me. Yeah, I find it a great week. It's going to be an exhausting week, and then I got to I got to get out of here and go into uh, Passover seder's right from this one. So, uh, you know, I, I think this year at the Passover table we're going to be asking five questions. Why is uh, Daddy so damn sleepy <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at the end of it? But yeah, this event is fun. It's interesting. The people here are so great, and you're right. This is the rich American dream story. And if you're if you're here and you're you're listening to the show, come on between come on down between one and three today and tomorrow. And what we're going to be doing is hearing your AHOA stories. I want to know what your American dream has been like, but if you're listening to this on the podcast, this happened weeks ago, so ignore what I just said. So, uh, uh, Eric, you know, it's been interesting to see what's going on in your world. Your job has completely changed, I would say, over the last couple of years since sure the Starwood Marriott acquisition. Um, I spoke at this event two years ago. I had the, uh, the honor of being on the main stage interviewing the CEOs, and that was uh, back before the deal closed, and I had um, Arnie on it. So a lot has changed since then. And what is it like taking all of these brands that came from the Starwood family and trying to incorporate them into the, the Marriott universe with the, uh, the systems and stuff? So maybe we could just take a look at some of the brands, sure. for example, that have come from there. I think the, the greatest place to start is uh, Element and the Loft, which I think are two solid concepts that I think need a little bit more, uh, more attention. Yeah, I think... Um, <clears throat> Couple things, uh, you know, late 2016 when we purchased uh, mm -hmm. and closed on the um, on the Starwood uh, acquisition, 
picking up 10 brands, three of them being uh, of the select service uh, segment and, and the balance being full service luxury uh, resident segment. Um, the, you know, we launched in, uh, in right. January of 17 at the Alice mm -hmm. Conference uh, an innovation pop-up. Um, we knew inherently the roots of Aloft and Element specifically had great um, connection to this consumer. The consumer right. loves those two brands, not just nationally, but internationally. So these are two brands that Starwood was doing a nice job of growing across continent. Uh, you know, traditionally, a lot of the brands have been started here, and then when you get to five, six hundred, then you start to take them outside the United States. They were deliberate about developing brands that they thought would um, uh, meet the consumer at all different types, uh, right. uh, coming from different types of uh, places in the world. So um, when we did the pop-up in 17, uh, that was, um, you know, at the end of 16, we brought together an advisory council, mm -hmm. which is it's one of the things I think Marriott gets high marks for. We're always integrating and innovating with our owner investor community right. and our operating community on everything that we do. We actually have over 110 different advisory councils. So the first thing we did was bring those um, that council together and say, what's working and what needs to be modified? Right. These weren't, this wasn't going to be a revolution. This was going mm -hmm. to be an evolution of the brands. And one of the things we also wanted to showcase was how do we innovate at Marriott today, right? right? So could, let me just set the stage before sure. we go into the innovating at Marriott today part. I felt like um, Element and the Loft were two smart directions for the former Starwood to go down. But I also felt that maybe they were a little bit ahead of, of their time, right? I think uh, Element focusing on wellness and stuff hadn't yet really caught on. And Aloft was all about uh, millennials, which I always say is more of the, the millennial mindset type of thing, right? right? So that was kind of the starting sure. point. So you got the, uh, the Innovation Lab 2017 outside. It was so much fun to see. Lots of great creative stuff. And I'm sorry, let me pick up the story Yeah, now. but it's from that innovation day that really mm -hmm. came or confirmed many of the concepts right. that our advisory council had come up with, mm -hmm. what owners, investors, consultants, uh, the consumers had told right. us, what did we needed to do to evolve the brand to make it even a better investment model? Because mm -hmm. remember, we're catering to two guests. We right. have consumers that sleep in the beds, and we have investors and builders who develop mm -hmm. the beds, right? So we needed to make sure both were in balance, and that's what that study was about. We knew we were winning with the consumer. We weren't winning with the investment community. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we really said, hey, help us to define what's going to make this a better operating model. How do we make the, bring the cost down? How do we make it a better investment model while still maintaining right. all the success that those two brands had, were having with engagement with the consumer across the world. Okay, so customers customers were into it, they were feeling it, but the ownership side of it was like, maybe this is a little too expensive, maybe we could do a little this, a little bit of that, and bring those two kind of sides together. So there was the, the yes, and so that's, p the, mm -hmm. the innovation pop-up was very specific about what, what's the offering in the, in the hotel. Right. Now, we're into the, you know, really the, the second year of the integration, mm -hmm. so... From January to September, um, really September 1st, we took all of those concepts, insights, a direction from the consumers and owners and investors, came back to the advisory council, said, all right, we, we, we confirmed what we want to do here. We need to change this. But by September 1, our team delivered on spec-ready programming, wow. spec-ready, purchase-ready product, new design in terms of how we had to modify the building. Um, everything was ready to go. So we're just really starting to, uh, to take advantage now mm -hmm. of really selling what is uh, the modified or updated element and aloft kind of programming and, and, and right. some of the design concepts. So what are some of the changes then that um, developers can see that you think that they're going to be really into and go, okay, now I'm ready for this brand? So if you go to, to aloft specifically, um, mm -hmm. re they really hadn't had a full design update since they launched the brand. So they were going on 10 years. Marriott has a cadence that really every three to five years, because we know we have a seven-year renovation cycle, that our owners and investors are going to start to look to us at how do I, you know, continue to keep my product up to date. Right. So we, that was, that's a big piece. So if you were to come and see uh, the new Aloft design package in the guest room, uh, we heard from the owners to take out some of the cost. Not necessarily so take out so much of the cost, but trade the cost for things that were uh, more relevant, easier to renovate. Uh, we could add more color. We could add mm -hmm. more art. Give me some flexibility in the room, and that's what we built in. Um, and then we came out with and just launched uh, this first quarter of the year a new food and beverage concept. One of the things that we were really challenged with Loft was the, the food scores. Right. Uh, we, you know, the consumers were saying, give me a better breakfast. 
We hear that around the world, right? Even mm-hmm. though everybody eats generally the same three or four things every single day for breakfast, when they get to the hotel, they say, right. give me something interesting. Hey, right? listen, look, I'm, I like to demand great, healthy eating options all the time. And then this morning, of course, I went for the waffle. <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> <laughs> so our food and beverage team, uh, Jason Newell and his, his team mm-hmm. came up with this awesome concept called POTS. This right. is for a loft specifically. And you can buy a pot. And if you think about this little pot, and it can have eggs and bacon, potatoes, uh, oh, but it's kind of a stand-up uh, eating. Uh, I thought I thought we were talking about Denver again. Sorry. No, 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 <laughs> not, not, not that kind of pot. <laughs> but it, we, I mean, what I, I I got so fired up about this right. is when you think about a brand that's growing across continent. Yeah. I can do a Korean breakfast and a Korean pot. Oh, I can sweet. Do, right. I can be in Europe and develop. You know. Uh, you know, bangers and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, beans and mm-hmm. all that good stuff that they like to eat in the morning. And so the pot concept, I think, is going to be really, really, it's going to take off well. Um, it's easy to understand. It's fresh made. Uh, you know, uh, they've done a really, really good about how to customize it in a very quick manner. But also meeting that millennial-minded traveler for a second who's really used today of kind of grab-and-go, stand-up eating, as we refer to it, whether that, you know, you look at the trends of, you know, people buying breakfast at, at Starbucks and, how many millions of people are doing that? But you know, it's really about not 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 everybody sitting around the table, particularly for breakfast this day. So give me something that I can uh, move with. Okay, so if people like the the food at Starbucks, then why weren't they happy with the <laughs> the food at, at a loft? Because that that food at Starbucks is not sitting the bar, the, the bar. Behind. Well, no, but a lot of people buy it. Yeah, um, and so, but it's about innovation, and I think that's the thing. We're, what we have taken, it, it's the concept of that stand up eating. Yeah, I'm not right. necessarily talking about the quality yes, I understand. of the food. It's about that grab and go. And I just wanted to slam Starbucks as I'm drinking my <laughs> Starbucks coffee that you can see here on. <laughs> on we never Facebook slam Live. our friends. Come yeah. on. <laughs> but it's just that concept of, mm-hmm. of how do we, you know, instead of having to be forced to sit down or right. go through a buffet, how do mm-hmm. I get something that I can take with me? that's fun and thoughtful, or if I just want to sit in the lobby and sit in a, a regular chair, right. then I can do it that way too. So anyways, um, and then on Element, mm-hmm. uh, we'll be opening the first kind of the new generation. Um, the big challenge there was just some of the design aspects from a cost perspective we had to pull out of the building. Stuff that the consumer would never even see, whether it was just the uh, uh, mechanical electrical mm-hmm. plan, it was um, some changes in some of the uh, finishes, um, it was... Uh, a concept that we also think, and, and I think our ownership community is getting excited about, is I won't call it a, a, a chase to, uh, uh, to try to compete wholeheartedly in the sharing um, mm-hmm. uh, concept of, of the world. I'm not going to say the name. Um, but how do we give a nod to those consumers who like to um, um, share communal space, communal right. travel, right? Mm-hmm. And so we've developed this common, this common suite. So in um, Element in itself, it's a mix of suites and standard guest rooms. That's the brand's always been that way. So we have now standard guest rooms that open up into a private uh, communal suite, let's call it. Right. Common, we call mm-hmm. it common suite. So this is a way for, you know, if you, if you were on a bachelor party, if you were on a, a, a leisure weekend, or you were traveling with ten or, you know, a business group and we're doing, you know, uh, we want to do a group meeting, you can actually buy the whole seat, which would be six or eight rooms, that open up into this communal suite. Well, I'm really glad that you brought this up, Eric, because I think this is a fabulous idea. I think it's really on trend right now. And and forget everything that you just said. I'll add a different perspective to it. Multi-generational travel, right. which is so huge right now. I can see grandma and grandpa in one room, mom and dad in another, the kids in one or two uh, other rooms, depending on how many you have, the in-laws, whatever it might be. And I think all of this has the idea of togethering. So That's instead correct. of just having to be alone together in the lobby with uh, everybody, you can now have your own private space that you could call your own to do whatever you That's want. Right. Especially with those uh, bachelor parties, or for me, if I'm craving a uh, you know a guy's weekend away and exactly. stuff like that, I could still be social but have the privacy that I personally uh, crave since I was uh, raised an only child. But it's not just a show social piece here. This is also an opportunity, I think, in the business community. If you think at federal call houses where you legal teams come together and work weeks at a time, right. this, this, this lends its hand to that. If you have tech teams or bio-research mm-hmm. teams who are doing group, group, um, group work together, right. which is what we hear a lot of today, these, this suite also provides its, its, uh, uh, it lends its hand to that. So yep. we require one. We have a number of owners who are putting one on each floor, and right. we have, you know, adding two or three. But we think it's a concept that I think will um, um, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll leverage the opportunity within the extended stay and, and the 
as to communal right. travel. Yeah. Now, I um, over the summer, I stayed at uh, one of those, uh, the Voldemort company, you know, the brand that shall not be named. And uh, uh, it was great because I had multiple bedrooms and then a common area for us to be productive, just like you were saying. Right. Um, you know, we were shooting video and doing all of that kind of stuff. So it was great to be able to spread out on a big table, get our work done, be productive, and just find more success. And I think that's really what the hospitality experience is getting to be all about, enabling the guests to find success and, you know, have a great environment in Agreed. which to do it. Agreed. I think that's the, that's, that's, we, we use those words a lot around our building. Yeah. Right? So uh, the other brand that I'm curious about, one of the legacy brands from Starwood is uh, the, the, the Four Points brand. Yeah. I, I felt um, under the old regime, it was the brand that time forgot. Nobody was really giving it the love and attention. Maybe it's just that the PR people weren't reaching out to me. I don't know. But <laughs> I feel like now that it's behind your engine, stuff is changing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good things going on around Four Points. I know, first of all, say from the development team and right. from the brand and, and the OFS team, we're excited about the opportunity. Uh, we are working on an updated um, <clears throat> uh, development plan. Right. Not, again, I'll call it a modification because Starwood had done a really nice job of, of just launching within the last year and a half mm -hmm. a really great room concept right. in partnership with West Elm. So it's a really great look and feel. Um, we just need to modify some of the, the overall building and bring down some of the cost. I think that's great because the, the whole West Elm partnership kind of changes the whole tenor of what the brand means to me. That's correct. Because to me, I felt like the brand used to be very uh, fungible, right? It could be any any name could be on the door and it would be the same kind of experience. Well, I, th I think when you know when they launched the brand, let's face it, they were they were struggling with uh, some old Sheridan hotels yep. that no longer kind of fit what the Sheridan brand was. A lot of it was location. It was suburban. In, you know, a hundred and sixty room, not a full, you know, a full service hotel in the sense of having the the, the big building and the big spaces and those kinds of things. So the suburban full mm -hmm. service hotel was struggling, and I think they what they ultimately did decided to to move, you know, create a brand to move some of that. So it had this connotation of it was a conversion brand, right? Right, right. right. But I would tell you today we have excellent number of new builds going on across the, uh, North America. We're going to come out with, in the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. a real development uh, incentive to help us drive growth around Four Points. So there's going to be real dollars that the company's going to stand behind this brand, say to the investment community, this is not a, a, a trash brand. Well, you know, right. This yep. is not where you, your old dying hotel goes. But this is going to be a fresh, relevant brand. Uh, the, 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 the product is great. Um, the, the programming is gre great, the Best Brews program, which is all about local craft brew programs and those kinds of things. And that resonates around and the world. And that's the one thing. And I'm kind of, a, I'm kind of annoyed because they were the craft brew brand before craft brews anyone that's cared right. about. They were the craft brew brand in the first round of craft brews in the, in the <laughs> mid to late 1990s. That's true. And then everyone forgot about it. And now all of a sudden it's the biggest business and everybody's trying to copy that. And, and by the way, it, it resonates around the world. So whether it's a four points in, in, in Europe or it's a four points in, in Asia, you know, beer is big, craft brew is big, you know, and I just think that, that it's a great program and it's helped to solidify, you know, listen, I'm not, I'm not a stuffy brand, I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm very approachable, come have fun, uh, enjoy, you know, West Elm does a wonderful job from a design of making pe people feel current, relevant, mm -hmm. and, and uh, comfortable in the guest room. Right. I, we think it's a great product with a lot of runway here in the United States and Canada and around the world for that matter. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's pretty cool. So um, what's it like for you over all being able to offer all of these different brand opportunities now to the franchise community? Is it tough to, is, well, is you, it easy or is it really just tough to keep track of all the brands that you have now? People always laugh because they've heard from me uh, this, uh, you know, we're, we're paid to say yes, we're never paid to say no so, right. <laughs> in the development <laughs> world. So the great thing is I don't have to say no, I have options today, right? And I think part of my job though, I will tell you, has become much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when I just had five brands to distribute and make sure we grow them all at the same rate and all that good stuff. Now that you have 10, uh, you know, I have 10 brand managers coming to my office after every uh, uh, development committee going, well, why did I only have two and that brand had five? Right. And so everybody wants to grow to the largest footprint that makes sense for that brand. They want to be in the best location. So, you know, it challenges my team to make sure that what we're doing in terms of uh, leading with a particular brand or a particular product is, is more insightful. And um, we're using... Um, uh, real data analytics to really try to define that for us. Mm -hmm. So when you come to me and have a site, you know, if, if it's select service for a minute, uh, we have 10 choices to help you determine what's going to be the best investment for you. Part of that is let's study about how uh, consumers are traveling 
and which types of consumers might be over-indexing in a particular market, right? And so we can then say, hey, lead with a distinctive product versus a right. uh, classic product, mm -hmm. right? And we, we're, we're actually utilizing um, big data analytics, mashing, to really kind of define which brand to lead with, what's the right number of keys uh, to build in this market, and then how do we um, also... Uh, um, uh, be able to speak to how big can that brand be in a particular region. Uh, that's super interesting to me that you're, now you're using the, uh, the the power of computing to be able to say, oh, this location is great and it would be perfect for this particular brand and we have, we've been able to crunch all this big data to that's prove right. our point. That's right. I mean, if you think about... Uh, you know, we've got um, uh, a Starwood, uh, SPG, right. uh, American Express. Mm -hmm. We have a, a Marriott Rewards mm -hmm. Visa. I mean, we, we know how you travel. We know what you eat. We know where you, you know, uh, what kind of car you drive right. and how many kids you have. Right, so how many pillows do I like at night? Three. Yes, you knew it. Oh, <laughs> wow, that big data, man. <laughs> now, all right, now, uh, now I'm totally freaked out. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's pretty great. So somebody comes to you, they, can, um, they could not only be given a suite of brands, but they could be told specifically here, 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 blah, 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 this is what you need. Can you get it down to even this is the optimal number of rooms that we believe that your market requires? Because of franchising laws, I can never get to the. I understand. Room. I'll okay. always give you a range. All right, my lawyers yes. would be happy with that. No, no, I appreciate but, the, I appreciate that answer, and the lawyers have got to make money too. So, <laughs> no, but what, one of the reasons we also do the the predictive analytics is to make sure that we are right sizing again right. with ten brands. We want to make sure there is excess in, in incremental demand mm -hmm. because one of the challenges we have and one of the things we always talk about with this group, AHOA, today is really about cannibalization, right? Right. And that's been some of the, the biggest concern around adding more brands onto the system. If I already have a courtyard of residence in and now you're going to bring in an element, is there enough demand for all of us to be healthy and successful or are you just cannibalizing, right? right. That's always a big topic in the franchising business. So this also gives us a tool to help say, hey, Demand is high here, and here's the appropriate number of rooms to build in this market that will, um, you know, the theory or the predictive right. part is that it will be the least impactful on our existing brands. So we are trying to take that into consideration as we are thinking about how we grow our brands in the market, making sure we have the optimal number of rooms without cannibalizing our existing That's system. great. That's a really nice and reassuring to hear because um, a lot of times um, I think the perception can be we're introducing a new brand just so we could sell it again to the community that you're in and put it across the street from you, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. So by, by having all this and the data to back it up, you could show that that's not the case and it's a lot... Uh, easier. Plus, you could probably sell it more easily to the guy that already has that hotel from that empty plot of land across well, again, the street. Again, if it says anything, at least we're looking at the information, right? right. Um, you know, there's a, there's always been a charge that we are charged with right. growth. We're we're yeah. a growth company, but you know, we take the motto at our at our companies: let's grow in the right places with the right product at the right time. And that's been part of the, our success and the partnerships that we have and why people want to do a business with Marriott is because we take that approach. Right. It's not just about growth for growth's sake. It's the right kind of growth at the right time. Right. If you're, if you're just tuning into the Facebook live feed that we have going on, I'm speaking with Eric Jacobs, Marriott International's Chief Development Officer of Select Brands North America. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that Fairfield uh, brand, right? Great. Um, now, uh, you're, you're expanding. It seems pretty nicely. Uh, the reason why I wanted to bring it up selfishly is because I stayed at a future Fairfield just this past weekend as we were recording. I took a, took the lovely bride to go see a concert in Brooklyn, and our kids were having a sleepover date in Staten Island. So I stayed at the uh, Staten Island Hotel of New York, which I thought was an unusual name. I walk in, I look to the right, it says, coming soon, Fairfield. Oh, so wow. <laughs> now, I got, now I got Fairfield on the, uh, the top of my, of, of, of my mind. Well, listen, we've, uh, you know, uh, about four or five years ago, came yep. out with a new, a new product, a new positioning. Mm -hmm. um, we, we knew that the brand needed a, um, a, a facelift, for that matter. Um, the uh, the uh, investment community was saying, hey, um, they're, 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 some of the other brands, competitive brands, are running out of spots. Uh, they're, over, uh, they're oversaturated. Uh, Fairfield's got an opportunity to grow. And then mm -hmm. we really worked hard with our partnership uh, in the community and said, look, we'll, we'll make this commitment if you guys would make this commitment. We now have, it's the largest pipeline here in North America. We're pushing almost 400 in the pipeline. What? We should reach uh, open, in, open hotels, thousands, a thousand Fairfields worldwide, probably later this year or early next year would be my prediction based, based on what we have under construction and projected openings. Wow. But we'll reach that thousand market. Now, compared to some of my competitive brands, that's still small uh, when you think about some of the other brands that are out there. 
But we, again, um, growing at the right place at the right time, not necessarily just growth for growth's sake. And I think that's the piece that we are focused on. If you look at how we like to grow, we want to be at the highest value locations and the highest value markets with the best partners in the business. So it's not always just about, right. you know. I have an old boss who used to say, is it just grow stupid or is it just grow stupid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an Adrian Curry quote, if anybody knows him out there. But, yeah. but, but we really are trying to manage, you know, the right kind of growth. Right. So uh, one place that you do want to grow is those uh, the Moxie brand of here in the the United States. Now mm-hmm. I happen to worldwide. Uh, yes, but uh, yes, we definitely want to. But I feel like it was clawed on globally more first, and here in the United States, it's a little bit behind. Yep. So I feel no, it's sure. right. It has European genes to it. It does. Right? It does. That's why I phrased it that way. But obviously, you want to grow it worldwide, and yep. I'm sure as soon as you have the opportunity, you'll put one on the moon too. But we well, would, right? But we're, uh, but I, I really like the brand. I happen to have uh, stayed at the New York one last right. November, and for those of you who are listening to the show, check out my interview with the Lightstone Group's Michelle Hochberg. We talk all about the development of the New York property, including the world's the the city's largest rooftop bar and all of those experiences there. So I liked it. I thought it was a very, a very good product to me. Very on trend in the sense that um, the rooms, um, they were New York small, but I didn't feel like they were small. I felt like it had everything I needed in the places that I needed it. And then the um, the public spaces were just uh, amazing. Yeah. I just I had so much fun connecting in different atmospheres with people. Well, you, you know, listen, we, we believe this brand resides in the public space. Right. I mean, that, that's the concept a bit. Um, you know, we are seeing um, worldwide rooms go smaller, not just rooms, everything getting smaller, right? We see how condos right. uh, and your homes are getting smaller. People Including are, me, I'm at the age now where I'm starting to shrink starting as well. Shrink. Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still growing, <laughs> so unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, you know, but what, what, when we give up, you know, so what we give up in terms of size in the guest room, we don't give up in quality, right? And, and actually you have a very well-appointed room. We're getting high scores, whether that's in Manhattan or Seattle or, or Denver, for a really thoughtful, fun, creative room, right? But it's not a room that you're, you know, you're kind of, you know, it's not like going to a luxury resort where you say, hey, I'm going to hang out in the room. Right. This is a room that's functional, well-appointed, but what I really want to, this, this is really going to the consumer says, I want to be out in the public. Right. And so it's really about the public space and the public space engagement. This is a brand where you check in at the bar right now. I mean, there is no front desk, right? Mm -hmm. For Marriott, think about this, right? A 90-year-old company, uh, you know, to launch a brand with no front desk is a is a is a little out there for us, right? You know, and and uh, and it it causes some of our executives go, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Where's the traditional play here? But that's part of what we're trying to do. Even in our own, you know, we want to be part of this disruption in the in the business as well. About thinking about how people are going to travel, how particular um, age demographic or psychographic. Right. You know, we're, it's no longer just demographic. It's about the psychographic. Uh, it's right? I, to me, it's always been about psychographics ever since. Um, Chip Conley back in the Joie de Vie uh, days really brought that to my That's attention. Right. I got to say 15, 18 years ago, That's right. once he came up with the revelation that, oh, we're going to design this hotel over this uh, this magazine, you know? That's correct. And it really changed the way I viewed hotels. And of course, you can listen to the Chip Conley interview on the No Vacancy Podcast. Check our uh, our our history there, whatever, the uh, backlog of shows, <laughs> or whatever I'm trying to say. <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting point um, uh, to me that you're making there. Because I think, you know, for many, many years when, when Marriott launched brands, we were always talking about... Uh, the broadest base customers we possibly could. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Moxie, more so than than ever, has um, ha- has really said, "Look, there's this age demographic, there's this uh, consumer um, psyche, which isn't necessarily age specific, right. that says I want to travel and I want it to be fun mm-hmm. and I want it to be." interesting and I want it to be in some cases um, communal right we're seeing all those travel trends because in some ways the public space is a bit nod to the old hostel days right right? where you would come together and meet people from all over the world in different walks of life Mm -hmm. and that's what this public space is really all about right whether you want to chill and work whether you want to chill and socialize whether you want to go down and you know have a good drink and laugh it up at the bar with your friends yeah and all of that kind of occurs in this public space and that's really about the the you know the business positioning of Moxie, it's about a great, small, well-appointed room with great, you know, finishes and, and amenities, but it's really about uh, a public space experience that you really want to hang out in, not just for an hour, but all afternoon, all day, and into the evening. Right. I was in, I, I happened to be in Frankfurt uh, two weeks ago, 
happened to walk in at 11 o'clock at night just to see what was going on, I wish I could have taken a movie. Right. There were people of all ages, some playing chess, some playing foosball, some having drinks at the bar, other people just working. And it's, it, and it's that concept yeah. that is where I think Moxie appeals. So how does uh, the property in Seattle or outside Denver, for example, differ than what my experience was like in New York? Because I'm sure... It's York's tied an aesthetically yeah. and emotionally to the communities in which they're in. Sure. Now, New York's an anomaly, right? It's yeah. got nine restaurants right. and bars. Not every one of our moxies is going to have well, it's that. Just not, it's just not practical or realistic. And, and, it's, and it's a 630-room yeah. hotel. But um, from a guest room perspective, you're going to see all of the same similar uh, fit and finishes and feel. Around the public space, and that's, that's the key around mm-hmm. moxie, no two public spaces are going to look alike. The, you know, you're going to have the bar, you're going to have the zones and the seating area, but how they're finished are going to relate to the local market. So Denver and Seattle, while very similar in terms of physical plant, the look and feel of each one of those is very right. unique, right? The one in Seattle feels very Seattle uh, around some of the finishes, some of the art that's in there, some of the drinks that they offer, some of the food offerings. But when you go to, you know, Denver, it's got an outdoor beer garden and things like that because, you know, you get, mm-hmm. you know, seven or eight months of yeah. just awesome outdoor experience. It's got a garage door and it really takes an indoor outdoor public space. So we're going to we're going to play with that no matter where we go. And we've got 14 under construction. So we'll have a number wow. of those continue to open uh, over the next 12 to 14 months. Uh, so we're excited about the path of that brand. So how do you approach um, creating something that gives the guest a promise from a particular point of view, but allows each hotel to live independently and breathe independently from its design and what its offerings are? In well, that's a little spaces. bit of the play in the boutique space, right? right? Yeah. I mean, in some ways, uh, uh, when when Marriott decided to go into this space, whether that was autograph, right, or, or in the case of Starwood Tribute, but thinking about how I play Moxie for a minute, and you look around the space, whether uh, there are other boutique independent hotels, there were um, some small boutique brands, our, our ownership group saw the trends and say, look, here's a space. It's a, I may not get the number exactly That's right, fine. but it's like right. a $1.5 billion uh, you know, customer space mm-hmm. as we define it. And, you know, Marriott didn't have a product to play in there, right? Right. So our opportunity to go play in this, um, you know, distinctive lifestyle with a very distinct point of view and not try to blend itself in with the broader base uh, portfolio of Mm -hmm. Marriott, but really stand out. I mean, it's truly uh, a different uh, experience for a Marriott branded hotel for a moment. Oh, yeah. it's it's it. We have, you know. Folks who have been staying with us, you know, 20, 30 years walk in there and their eyes just go, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the first time I walked in, and I have to say the New York property in because it's my only frame of reference at this point, it just did not feel like the traditional Marriott experience. And I think that opens up the company to a lot of opportunities, you know? Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to also appeal, again, when you think about the world customer that continues to develop today, it's no longer, I mean, 20 years ago we studied... 98% we study the American consumer. Today, this is about a global consumer. Right. And even the American consumers become more global, right? I think about the number of trips I've taken in the last 10 or 15 years across, whether it's China, you know, and throughout Asia, whether mm-hmm. it's through the Middle East, right. or whether it's through Europe, we're all becoming much more, you know, uh, globe trekking. And so how do we appeal to you and how do we appeal to all these different likes right. and dislikes around the world and have a portfolio that meets them at their needs and at their price point? Right. And, uh, you know, with so many brands um, in your family, I think it's 32 at this point overall. I still think it's 30, but there's some brand extensions in there. May, you know, right. when you take Ritz, Ritz Residences. Yeah, all right. You know, I think we'll we say 30. say 30. There's right. some brand extensions. We'll say there. 29 so Mary could feel Ritz. young and sexy. Sure. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm really, really good at making horrible, horrible jokes. Okay. So, um, so to, to me, that gives you lots of uh, opportunities uh, there right. as, as well. I happen to stay at uh, AC Hotel in Madrid. Um, my, I have not stayed at many autograph collection hotels. That was great. There's one here. Um, that used to be a uh, a former company's brand that you're yep. now that you're now having, AC, and, that's and it's great to see uh, it's great to see that over there. I love the uh, the AC hotels because again it follows that same similar DNA but um, highly localized I- experiences, and yeah. we all know that that's what everybody wants from the full service hotels to the select service hotels that you focus on. Yeah, I think it's that you know listen the consistency is around a comfortable, safe, uh, welcoming stay, one that folks where the associate. I mean, listen, everybody's got great room. 
rooms. Everybody's got yeah. great boxes. It's really about what do the associates do mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, igniting a stay. And, and, and you know those personal connections that the associates create. But certainly the environment that we put them in and how we design them and finish them mm -hmm. helps to promote that. And I think that's the key. And that's really where we are focused on. It's not just innovating in the guest room around technology right. or design. It's also about how do we t you know, think about our associates and how do they engage today and what tools do we give them to engage today because the consumer expects so much more because we're all carrying a concierge in our hand and an yeah. iPhone, right? Right. Uh, well, so. honestly, I'm getting tired of the concierge in my in, in my pocket, right? Yeah. Um, I think to me, and we'll, we'll wrap up after this part of the conversation, sure. the, uh, it, it's – I – thought like I loved a particular site that allowed me to to focus on restaurants, but I'm starting to realize over time that, sure, it could have uh, 155 star ratings, but it doesn't mean those people know good food. It doesn't mean people know good service. That's and right. I've come to the realization that if I could connect with someone at the hotel that really has an understanding of the local community and make me feel like an insider within that community, there we can have a special moment of hospitality which will engage me more with the hotel even if I'm eating down the street. Well, and I think that's where the evolution or the innovation of where technology is going to allow us to do that going forward. When you mm -hmm. think of the old concept is I am a front desk clerk. Clerk meant transaction today. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can release these associates from behind the desk and in, in, in providing a transaction, now they become true that's experience right. hosts. That's and I right. think that's the future of travel. I think that's the future of how we will engage with our customers is to, is to take our associates and make them true hosts of the hotel and of their overall experience in the community, not just selling a hotel room, yep. but the experience of where they are in that location. And, uh, and again, you know, you focus on the select service properties, and you are absolutely right. It's all about turning what used to be transactional into the experiential, taking your staff folks and having them and setting them up so they can make those emotional connections with guests because we absolutely. have so much technology out there that we're losing sight of why hospitality is great. It's hospitality because of people. And while AI is terrific and it's going to enable um, a st a state to be better, it will only do it if the people can make it work. That's right? correct. And take advantage of it. Yep. That's right. And, All right. And so uh, I think we should wrap up here with a, uh, with a good quality shameless plug from you. Go for it, Eric Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, here at Marriott, we're at the AHOA Convention. Uh, we're happy to be here. My whole team here from across the United States, 26 of us strong. Uh, we're looking to engage uh, with as many owners uh, as we can today. But overall, again, uh, Marriott's a great place uh, to work for me. We love doing business. We love, um, as, as Mr. Marriott challenges us every day, it's not just um, how, uh, the business that we do, it's how we do the business. And I think if we were going to make one big plug is our approach to development and partnership is the key to our success. Great. Pick great partners, make the right decisions one by one, and not just take a broad-based uh, approach to it. How can somebody find you and your team, assuming they're not at the AHO event, because this podcast will run as an audio version a couple of weeks after this, uh, after this event is over? Ooh. All right. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, right. other than giving him my just, personal number, yeah, but I'm not yeah, sure just, I want to uh, do that. You, you can find Eric Jacobs on uh, LinkedIn. And of course, you can go to the Marriott, uh, Marriott, Marriott De International how about Development Mar site. How about MarriottDevelopment.com? That would you, be the best place for there them to go. There you go, MarriottDevelopment.com. <laughs> you can find him over there. This has been uh, a lot of fun. I feel fun like fun. you were right. We could have spoken for three hours today. This is really terrific. Thank you. Right, it's fun to have a nice, easy, free-flowing conversation. And I will be back with you guys with another interview, unless, of course, I decide to uh, go get lost at a Denver Moxie. Thanks right. for listening. Thank you.